Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second of our Let's Talk About Corporations uh, seminar and now webinar series. Uh, my name is Jason Harris. I'm the director of the Ross Parsons Center for Commercial Corporate and Taxation Law here at Sydney Law School. Uh, and I'll be chairing today's event. Um, we're still waiting on a few people to dial in, but that's okay. We'll get started in the interest of time. Uh, the topic for today's webinar is Rethinking Federal Enforcement of Corporate Law, the Proposed Federal Civil Law Enforcement Agency, the Merits. Our keynote speaker today is Kerry Abadie. She's one of my colleagues here at Sydney Law School. Kerry's teaching corporation law here for us uh, over the last couple of years and this year as well. And Kerry's currently undertaking her PhD uh, looking at the uh, post Hain Commission uh, ASIC enforcement track record. So Kerry's been thinking quite a lot about uh, some different models for law, civil law enforcement in the uh, corporate law sphere. And uh, Kerry's going to take us through probably for about 30, 35 minutes or so uh, if you do have any questions while Kerry's speaking, you should be able to see a QA and a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And so if you wouldn't mind posting your question in the Q&A button, and then there'll be time for questions at the end of the presentation. At the end of Kerry's presentation, we will have some comments from Dr. Vicky Komono, who's a senior lecturer up at the TCBE School of Law at the University of Queensland. And for those of you who've been following this series of events, uh, you would be aware that uh, uh, Vicky uh, very kindly came down to the University of Sydney about a month or so ago and delivered the second uh, event in this particular series, Let's Talk About Corporations. Just in terms of the background of this event series, this is a joint initiative of Sydney Law School and uh, UQ uh, Law School. And it's called Let's Talk About Corporations because really what we're trying to do is certainly showcase some of the excellent research that the academic staff from each of our law schools are undertaking. Uh, but also we really wanted to reach out to the legal profession and the business community to offer some different perspectives on uh, different aspects of corporate regulation. So our discussion in the previous event was looking at some of the corporate scandals involving Crown and the Commonwealth Bank, the role of ASIC uh, in that. Today's event, as I said, is the proposed Federal Civil Law Enforcement Agency and ASIC. And our next event at which I'll be the uh, keynote speaker, which will be on the 15th of June, is looking at accessorial liability in, uh, in particular in corporate regulation. So really what we would like to see is in a session like this, if you've got any thoughts, if you've got any comments, if you've got any experience with some of the matters that we're discussing, then we'd certainly like to hear from you. And you can post your questions or comments in the Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So without further ado, oh, I should actually also just say that we are recording this session and the recording will be available uh, after the uh, commencement, uh, after the completion of the uh, session. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our speaker, Kerry Abadie. Thanks, Kerry. Hello, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us. Okay. In thinking about the merits of a civil law enforcement body, our agenda is as follows. First, I'll give an overview of today's topic before putting the possible establishment of a new litigation agency in context. I'll then discuss the model put forward by Commissioner Hayne in the Banking Royal Commission's final report. A matter of contextual importance is the relevance of civil penalties to ASIC, which is item four on the agenda. I'll then move to the benefits and limitations of the model before setting out alternative models of restructuring ASIC. And at that point, I'll invite Dr. Komono to make some comments on those proposals. And at the end, we'll invite, um, and so during the presentation, if you've got any thoughts or suggestions as to how the competing views on restructuring ASIC might be re resolved, they'd be most welcome. So by way of overview, 
The Hain Inquiry's proposal of a federal civil law enforcement agency appears to have been an original idea. That was one reason why, in February 2019, when the idea was proposed, Hain characterised the proposal as radical. He didn't say exactly why. This may have been because he appreciated the general aversion of governments to establishing new agencies. Changing admin ASIC's administrative structure would be no easy task. There'd be considerable cost and expense. For example, you'd need high level executives and staff for the new agency, and there would be surplus executives and other staff within ASIC who have security of tenure or time to be served on fixed contracts to be paid out. Since the Hain inquiry and consistent with its recommendations, ASIC's external oversight in arrangements, including those concerning enforcement, have changed. Previously, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, known as the PJC, consisting of five members of each House, House of Parliament, carried out principal oversight of ASIC. But since the 1st of July 2021, when the Financial Regulator Assessment Authority, FRA, was established, ASIC has been the subject of an additional layer of scrutiny. As FRA is obliged to assess and report to the Minister on ASIC's effectiveness and capability. FRA's original mandate was to review ASIC's effectiveness every two years, but with budget cuts announced in last week's budget, the review cycle has been extended to five years. As FRA issued its inaugural review of ASIC in 2022, a broader review encompassing enforcement will now not be due before 2027. Treasury justified the revised timetable on the basis that ASIC would be given time to progress its responses between reviews. A counter argument made by the Australian Financial Markets Association is that effectively the government dropped the ball on improving the efficiency and effectiveness of ASIC. And now more than ever, the FRA reviews remain vital to the form, function and efficiency of Australia's financial markets. Now it's been suggested that the life cycle of a regulatory agency is first youthful exuberance, then middle age and finally senescence. The question is, if ASIC has reached senescence, what to do? A range of options have been tabled, including a civil law enforcement agency, all of which I suggest are worthy of further consideration and debate. My own view is that a new litigation body is of sufficient merit at this stage to remain in the mix as the debate continues as to whether, and if so, how to replace ASIC. Before discussing the model itself, I will set the scene. Hayne was very critical of ASIC's approach to enforcement. In a nutshell, he said, when ASIC was confronted with serious breaches of the law by large entities, the outcomes yielded by ASIC were nothing more than a few infringement notices, an enforceable undertaking not to offend against with or without an immaterial public benefit payment or some agreed form of media release. Given the long-standing nature of ASIC's problems with enforcement, ASIC immediately responded to the Royal Commission's findings by accepting it had to improve its ineffective culture. ASIC accepted that when confronted with serious misconduct, all regulatory options were open and ASIC's operational discipline and starting point was to ask the question, why not litigate? But in 2021, the why not litigate strategy was abandoned after Joe Longo became the ASIC chair and it was a re replaced by a strategy of considered and proportionate action. By October 20, 2022, however, community frustrations with ASIC's enforcement record led to the commissioning of an inquiry into ASIC investigation and enforcement by the Senate. The argument that ASIC should be de-established is contained in submissions to the Senate inquiry, which will closely consider ASIC's enforcement record and capability. The Hain Inquiry's observations about ASIC's ineffective enforcement practices in dealing with an extensive remit, overwhelming workload, and the exponential growth of civil penalty provisions in the statute books and the related procedural law led Hain to the quote-unquote radical proposal of a federal civil law enforcement agency. 
So what was the form of the agency proposed by Hain? In concept, the model was based on the role of the specialist agencies of the Commonwealth and the states and territories in prosecuting criminal breaches. First, the investigation of a set of facts. Second, the preparation of a brief of materials by ASIC to the new agency on the basis that a specific evidentiary threshold was crossed. Third, the decision to commence civil penalty proceedings and the right to litigate would be that of the new agency, not ASIC. On this approach, ASIC would retain all its regulatory tools except for the right to litigate in relation to civil penalty prov provisions. The, post, the process reflects that followed by the CDPP in relation to the prosecution of criminal offences following a referral by an independent investigative agency such as ASIC. Now, a defining feature of the CDP's practice and procedure is that it's conducted in ways independent of and detached from the investigation process. In particular, the CDPP makes an independent assessment of a brief of evidence from an investigative agency by applying the Commonwealth's prosecution policy to the relevant facts and surrounding circumstances before determining whether there's sufficient available evidence and it's in the public interest to institute a prosecution. It appears that the operational independence and the stricter controls associated with a government prosecution agency attracted Hain, who was unsettled by the unsatisfactory ways in which ASIC had exercised its enforcement direct discretion. Reasoning by analogy from arguments in favour of an independent prosecution agency, the new agency would have at least three advantages. First, the ability to assess cases for litigation and ensure that the entire process in, is independent. Second, the role and culture of the agency would be distinct from ASIC's. And third, consistency of principle and priorities from a whole of government perspective could be more easily achieved by the existence of an agency with an overview of the full range of civil penalties enforceable by Commonwealth regulatory agencies. So examples of other Commonwealth regulatory agencies who enforce civil penalty provisions include the ABA, the ACA, APRA, CASA, the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, the Office of the Information Commissioner, Services Australia, and the TGA. The High Court stated in Commonwealth and Director Fair Work Building Industry Inspectorate that both criminal prosecutions and civil penalty proceedings may be instituted by an agent of the state in order to establish a contravention of the general law and in order to obtain the imposition of an appropriate penalty. Accordingly, in principle, a properly constituted agency of the state other than ASIC itself could institute civil penalty proceedings on ASIC's behalf. But the difference in litigious outcomes sought by a prosecution agency on one hand and the litigious outcome which would be sought by a civil law enforcement agency on the other is of great importance and consequence as the High Court has explained. A criminal prosecution is aimed at securing and may result in a criminal conviction. By contrast, a civil penalty proceeding is precisely calculated to avoid the notion of criminality as such. You can't equate a regulator's position with that of a prosecutor. In terms of general principle, the prosecutor is a servant of justice, not a servant of government or individuals whereas the regulator is permitted to advocate for a litigious outcome which the regulator considers to be in the public interest. As such, while at first blush, Haynes' model of a civil law enforcement body is consistent with the model of a government prosecution agency, in my view, there are fundamental differences in the underpinning values and objectives to be accommodated if a civil law enforcement agency is to be established. ASIC's power to commence civil proceedings would need to be made subservient to the new body to ensure that decisions of the new body to commence proceedings prevail, and the new body could also be given the power to take over a proceeding and make decisions about whether to continue or discontinue a proceeding. That might be a problem, though, because it could lead to systemic tensions of the kind commentators have observed between ASIC and the um, Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, arising from differences in the statutory roles of the independent regulator and an, in, and an independent prosecution agency.
Before, to turn, before turning to the benefits and limitations of Haynes' model, we should consider why civil penalties are contained in legislation and the choices a regulator must make. Now that was explained by the, Common, by the High Court in Commonwealth and Director Fair Work Building Industry Inspectorate, which said that in essence, the point of a civil penalty provision is to secure compliance with legislation with the statutory purpose of protecting or advancing specific aspects of the public interest. Usually the legislation provides for a range of enforcement mechanisms, including injunctions, compensation orders, disqualification orders, and civil penalties with or without criminal offences. The regulator must choose the enforcement mechanism or mechanisms which it considers to be most conducive to securing compliance with the regulatory regime. In turn, that requires the regulator to balance the competing considerations of compensation, prevention and deterrence. And finally, it requires the regulator, having made those choices, to pursue the chosen options or options as a civil litigant in proceedings. ASIC's civil penalty regime came into effect more than 30 years ago on 1st of February 1993. The essential idea was that ASIC would be able to obtain a just civil outcome cheaply and quickly. Nowadays, there are more than 125 civil penalty provi provisions contained in the Corporations Act in three broad categories, corporation scheme, financial services, and uncategorised. The practice and procedure for civil penalty litigation is well developed, but some commentators think that procedural weaknesses remain, which are detrimental to the efficient conduct of litigation. As Justice Gagler has acknowledged, what hasn't been resolved by the High Court is whether a regulator bringing proceedings is subject to some form of duty that can be described as a duty to conduct litigation fairly, as the High Court assumed that duty without deciding it in ASIC and Helicar. The establishment of a new civil law enforcement agency would give Parliament the opportunity both to give content to the new body's obligations in bringing civil penalty proceedings and reform problematic areas, clarifying issues of proof, privilege and procedure. Commissioner Hayne perceived four benefits of Federal Civil Law Enforcement Agency. First, the agency would have to develop core skills in what is an increasingly specialised area of the law. Second, judgments about public interest considerations would be made by the independent body who would build expertise in making judgments about case selection. Third, the Twin Peaks model would be maintained, meaning that ASIC would retain its licensing authority and the power to pursue action under a licence. This would ensure ASIC has ongoing contact with the regulated community. Fourth, since litigation decisions would reside with an independent agency, the problem of regulatory capture of ASIC by industry in relation to litigation decisions would be eliminated. Hain, however, had some uncertainties about the proposal. In particular, the extent to which it would have unintended adverse consequences for ASIC. Because of the idea of gradations of sanctions based on strategic regulation theory and the enforcement pyramid model. Now turning to the benefits. Specialist practical skills in legal interpretation, forensic inquiry, evidence procedure and regulation are applied in the conduct of civil penalty litigation. By establishing a separate civil law enforcement agency, the state would accrue to it these practical skills across the plethora of statutory civil penalty regimes. In managing its civil penalty caseload, ASIC briefs out a range of civil penalty matters to legal practitioners working at private law firms as well as the Australian Government solicitor. A review of ASIC's media releases re reveals some recent examples of referrals to different top tier private practitioners, such as the Star Entertainment Section 180 direct breach of duty of care case. There's an argument taking currency in relation to the use of external assistance by Australian governments that there's a serious erosion of capability in the public service. This is said to be particularly applicable to the engagement of consultants by the Commonwealth Government, brought into the spotlight by the PwC tax information secret scandal. But future governments might look back at ASIC in time and think that the use of external law firms eroded ASIC's capabilities. Each time ASIC engages external solicitors, it expends considerable resources in procuring these services through competitors and 
through competitive tenders and other arrangements. These costs, including opportunity costs, could also be saved by establishing a new specialist litigation agency. ASIC's largest civil penalty cases, such as Storm Financial, have cost ASIC more than $55 million, so it's hard not to see how there could be some cost savings. In terms of the development and maintenance of specialist skills, in my view, ensuring that ASIC can properly meet its disclosure and discovery obligations to the court will be critical. The continual movement of monumental amounts of data onto ASIC servers requires proper record keeping, detailed analysis by ASIC's investigation teams, and appropriate steps consistent with obligations to the, administra in a, sorry, the administration of justice to ensure that cases aren't delayed by errors or other missteps when complying with the ASIC's disclosure and discovery obligations. The errors conceded by the ACT Director of Public Prosecutions in relation to his obligations to disclose certain material to the Defence and the ACT Supreme Court in R versus Lerriman exposed in cross-examination of the DPP last week at the current Sofronoff inquiry and the related media storm are a cautionary tale. In October 2022, an updated standard, the Australian Government Investigation Standards came into effect, aimed at the delivery of first rate investigative practices and outcomes by government agencies. Fundamental obligations to which ASIC must adhere, including disclosure management in criminal proceedings and civil and administrative proceedings are, are articulated in that standard. In view of ASIC's onerous disclosure and discovery obligations and the risks to the legitimacy of the administration of justice should ASIC fall short, it's arguable that ASIC should concentrate on optimal performance of its investigation role, preparing and referring quality civil penalty briefs to a specialist agency, and then providing ongoing going support to litigation rather than running the litigation itself. On the other hand, ASIC is a repeat player in the justice system, appearing in court somewhere in the country every day. ASIC pursued 64 pe civil penalty proceedings against corporations in the years 2015 to 2020, whereas there are only eight matters against corporations prosecuted by the CDPP in that period. As ASIC tends to repeatedly lit litigate a fairly narrow scope of sections of the corporation's legislation, although this is a problem in itself, ASIC can be selective in the cases it runs or refrains from settling in order to maximise its prospects of favourable outcomes. In the same vein, it's arguable that the increased use of top tier legal practitioners with greater expertise and access to specialist knowledge in relation to substantive law and court processes also maximises six chances of civil penalty litigation success. Nevertheless, ASIC has no monopoly on its repeat player status, which could be enjoyed by a new body. After observing that the regulatory pyramid had significantly featured in evidence and submissions before him, Hain attributed ASIC's struggle with the policy of strategic regulation to its inability to select cases consistently with the policy's assumption that not all contraventions of law are of equal significance. Hain found that ASIC shouldn't dismiss breaches of offence and civil penalty provisions governing financial services entities or any other provisions because ASIC's enforcement of all laws should be governed by the same principles of enforcement. For many years, ASIC advocated for higher penalties and extra dual track provisions to gain more flexibility to pursue a criminal or civil penalty outcome against an, an individual, depending on the extent to which ASIC can prove the fault element of intention, knowledge or recklessness. ASIC got its wish and almost all the civil penalty provisions in the Corporations Act are now dual track. There's an argument though in the corporate law scholarship that in relation to those parts of the Corporations Act containing the corporations and securities law, insufficient thought has been given to the extent to which an individual director defendant will be given a fair trial in relation to an alleged civil penalty contravention under a Corporations Act section, previously an offence provision alone. Such concerns relate to limitations in relation to fundamental rights, such as the availability of defences in civil penalty proceedings, 
interference with the burden of proof in that some civil penalty contravention categories are strict liability provisions requiring the defendant to take preventative measures to discharge the onus of proof and denial of criminal law process rights, including the presumption of innocence, the right not to incriminate oneself, the right to have a sentence reviewed by a higher tribunal and the right not to be tried or punished twice for the same offence. The position now is that the maximum civil penalty, pecuniary penalty that can be imposed on an individual under a Corporations Act dual track provision is in every single instance larger than the maximum criminal fine for the same but more, more culpable conduct. But a director can't be indemnified by their company for or insured against liability for either a fine or a civil penalty. So the financial consequences are going to sit on them directly in both situations. So the up upshot is that the expanded regulatory toolkit to many more dual track provisions combined with the significant increase in the maximum pecuniary, pecuniary penalties, both in absolute terms and in terms relative to maximum criminal penalties in, in respect of the same but more culpable con conduct, is that individuals punished by the state for unintentional conduct may be insufficiently protected when they're the target of enforcement action by ASIC. In this context, the imposition of punishment without fault and the impact of ASIC strategy requires careful consideration. Parliament could ensure that a civil law enforcement agency exercising its powers at arm's length from ASIC would be required to factor in the impact of ASIC's regulatory strategies on, individual, on individuals and corporations for that matter and appropriate principles and protections could be developed to assist the regulatory task. In relation to Twin Peaks and regulatory capture, it's difficult to contradict Haynes' observation that establishment of a specialist civil law enforcement agency wouldn't compromise the Twin Peaks regulatory structure. Retention of that model was supported by Haynes. Under the Twin Peaks model, financial supervision in Australia is divided between ASIC in its capacity as the corporate regulator and APRA as the banking regulator. The general underpinning philosophy being that one peak regulator is mostly responsible for conduct and disclosure regulation and the other peak regulator mostly responsible for the supervision of entities that require prudential regulation. As the distinguishing feature of this arrangement is that prudential regulation is located outside our central bank, the RBA, a new agency with litigation rather than regulatory or supervisory responsibilities wouldn't cut across the conduct prudential divide. The fourth and final benefit suggested by Commissioner Hain was that a civil law enforcement agency could limit the scope for regulatory capture, this being a common problem for regulators globally. The argument is that ASIC is especially susceptible to the protection of business interests. ASIC sought to address the issue of regulatory capture by establishing an office of enforcement and introducing an extra layer of management between ASIC's executive management responsible for enforcement and the Commission. While Hayne agreed that such functional separation between enforcement and other regulatory functions was consistent with cultural change, he didn't comment on the role of commissioners and whether they could be relied on for the necessary objectivity he had found so wanting. ASIC's Office of Enforcement will be disbanded from the 1st of July this year and replaced by two divisions, an enforcement division and a regulation supervision division. A new civil enforcement law body would maximise the distance between ASIC's daily dealings with the entities it regulates in accordance with Commissioner Haynes' advice. For two reasons, Haynes refrained from recommending the radical change of a specialist civil law enforcement agency. The first reason being that ASIC should be given an opportunity to improve its enforcement culture which ASIC undertook to do. The second reason was uncertainty about the implications for ASIC's work, given that civil penalties are a central feature of, a, of Australia's corporate regulations, theoretical underpinnings of strategic regulation and the enforcement pyramid. On the first point, 
ASIC's commissioners have made it clear that ASIC can no longer be soft and it's prepared to seek significant court-based outcomes. It appears to be doing so, although this is still a controversial matter and ASIC is still being criticised in some quarters for, the, for being the watchdog no one fears. For instance, the head of Arita was quoted as saying that ASIC is too scared to prosecute and ASIC's recent restructuring of its enforcement division wouldn't break the permafrost of a poor culture that had permitted Australia to be a paradise for white collar criminals. Another view is that ASIC's lack of trans transparency and accountability over decades are sufficient reasons to justify a separate civil law enforcement agency, contending that ASIC is responsible for a deliberate strategy of obfuscation so that the public is kept in the dark about how little ASIC actually does across its various teams. ASIC's core job must extend beyond specific areas each year, so the argument goes, and should not come at the expense of overlooking vast, vast swathes of misconduct. As to the other point, the changes to the corporation's legislation have been described in the scholarship as accretive. Most of the recent changes flowed from the recommendations in the 2017 ASIC Enforcement Review Task Force report and then those of the Hain Inquiry. Whilst Hain touched on the issue of the possible implications for strategic regulation should there be a policy change, the ASIC Enforcement Re Review Re Task Force report, interestingly, did not address this issue in making all the various recommendations, recommendations it made to strengthen, to strengthen the penalties for corporate and financial sector misconduct. On the other hand, in its submission to the Senate inquiry, ASIC referred to its application of the combination of strategic regulation theory and harms-based approaches and its use of forceful enforcement action being at the heart of our effectiveness as a regulator. ASIC argued that litigation is integral to its enforcement toolkit and that it's demonstrated willingness to escalate to the most serious kind of enforcement action where required is key to sending strong messages of deterrence. So is there a particular operational reason why it's preferable that decisions about whether or not to commence a civil penalty proceeding should remain within ASIC? It's likely ASIC would have concerns about delays in the civil penalty process should ASIC lose certain powers, especially in the near term, at a time ASIC is prioritising the reduction of investigation timeframes and the ASIC chair is currently restructuring ASIC's internal operations with that goal in mind. In the past two years, ASIC has reported on ASIC hasn't met the criteria it set itself for an express investigation of 12 months for either criminal or civil investigations. This is a real issue for ASIC given the considerable lag between the time of misconduct and the date final appeals are determined. The irony is that the very reason for the introduction of the civil penalty regime in the first place was to overcome certain delays ASIC was experiencing with the CDPP in the first years after establishment. Back then, ASIC also announced plans for a 12-month investigation timeframes, and 30 years later, the same issue presents. So which alternative ways of restructuring ASIC have been proposed to tackle ASIC's enforcement performance issues and reduce its regulatory burden? Whilst Hain declined to detach any aspect of ASIC's remit in terms of alternatives, one idea is that a specialist con consumer regulator for retail financial services, a third peak, would complement the work undertaken by ASIC as market and securities conduct regulator and APRA as prudential regulator. This would benefit ASIC by ensuring that ASIC's primary objective is securing the proper functioning of financial markets and the proper governance of important corporations rather than protecting consumers. The idea being that companies and markets aren't constrained by excessive or inappropriately interventionist regulation. While tight regulation is necessary in the consumer space, it can come at a cost in terms of efficiency, innovation and entrepreneurship if applied more broadly. Other suggestions for the restructuring of ASIC's financial services mandate are first to constitute a separate division within ASIC or second to constitute the regulator as a separate division within the ACCC. I note in passing that in this year's federal budget, whilst funding for the FRA has been cut 
the ACCC's remit has expanded with the creation of a national anti-scam centre and a new complaints mechanism for consumers and small business advocacy to raise systemic issues under the, and under the consumer law. A further alternative which has been proposed is to split ASIC into smaller regulators along the lines of its broad business areas. Shipton proposes the establishment of a new standalone regulators, one for superannuation and another for insurance. Arita suggests that improved regulation would flow from the creation of a single specialist agency responsible for both personal and corporate insolvency law. In terms of proposals for further internal reform, a further suggestion by Dr Komino is that ASIC should develop its own pros prosecutorial arm to achieve a more consistent approach to decision making. As well as ensuring ASIC has independent prosecutorial power, this would require additional powers as ASIC is not an inter interception agency under the Telecommunications Interception and As Access Act. It would be up for debate within the business community as to whether it would be prepared to be subject to ASIC's use of covert surveillance by amended legislation rather than merely overt surveillance as is currently the case. The Australian Institute of Company Directors argues that an appropriate area of reform for ASIC is to put an alternative board structure in place for ASIC's governing body currently comprising only of ASIC's commissioners to introduce external perspectives and impartiality. Hayne expressly rejected this idea in view of the radical changes he required ASIC to make, but times have changed. Such a reform could help address the issue raised in a further submission to the Senate by the Financial Services Council that ASIC has strayed into areas of policy more properly left to Parliament particularly in relation to technical rules and matters of detail and instruments. Dr Harris suggested to the Senate inquiry that ASIC should reconsider its toolbox and focus more on administrative and automated sanctions rather than focusing on costly and slow litigation enforcement. The nature of ASIC's work has changed, especially since the pandemic, and as I've mentioned, is now being reorganised into two principal divisions. If ASIC is to be broken up, the business lines to be carved out of ASIC's main mandate seem less, less obvious should such restructuring proceed. And it's apparent from the first round of written submissions to the Senate inquiry that there are competing views about how any restructuring should occur. it will be interesting to observe the approach the Senate takes to resolving the relative importance of the different views. I now invite Dr Komono to comment on the alternative models to Haynes' proposal. Oh, thank you very much, Kerry, and, and I'm sure your insightful presentation will um, generate lots of discussion and views essentially about whether ASIC is still fit for purpose. So Kerry's focused on the, um, the proposal for a new federal civil enforcement agency, while I've been tasked to comment on at least a couple of the, I think it was eight, <laughs> alternative suggestions she's outlined um, for restructuring ASIC. Before doing so, however, I wanted to pick up on a point that Kerry made about, uh, and that is the suggestion that the life cycle of a regulatory agency is first youthful exuberance, then middle age and, and senescence to make uh, comments in relation uh, to ASIC. So as for youthful exuberance, from the beginning when ASIC was established in 1991, um, in contrast to its predecessor, which was the National Companies and Securities Commission, whose legacy um, are the so-called corporate cowboy cases of the 1980s, it adopted a highly public emphasis on strategies designed to deter misconduct. And we had um, Tony Hartnell, who was the inaugural ASIC chair, um, announcing a hit list of companies that would be investigated as a matter of um, priority. As far as middle age is concerned, I would consider um, the period probably from about 2002 to 2012 in terms of um, uh, ASIC success with um, uh, enforcement as probably being the most successful in that, yes, there were some um, major failures or major, yeah, major failures uh, or losses, uh, such as in the uh, 
as against one tell director Jodie Rich and Mark Silverman. Um, but it, it also had a number of successes against some directors in high profile cases, most notably HIH um, and, and also in, in the James Hardy case. So in answer to the question um, that we're thinking about now, has ASIC reached its um, senescence? Here we are over 30 years later and ASIC is still beset by the same sorts of problems, especially in the wake of the Hain Royal Commission um, that exposed misconduct on a scale that no one imagined and of course criticised ASIC's enforcement culture, which led it to, as Kerry pointed out, initially responding at least officially um, uh, with the why not litigate strategy um, now overtaken by um, uh, Joe Longo's what, what, what he's called forceful litigation, um, being an, an integral part of the toolkit to send strong messages of, de of deterrence. And we, we've also had a, a conduct, uh, a misconduct hit list announced by the Deputy uh, Chair of ASIC, Sarah Court. Um, and, and it's, of course, this that's led to the current Senate inquiry and the suggestions for restructuring it. So as far as the suggestions are concerned, I would support any of the suggestions that decrease ASIC's remit. Uh, and they include uh, this, the idea of this third peak, a specialist consumer regulator for retail financial services, which I think was the first. Uh, another one was taking corporate insolvency from ASIC and giving it to a new specialist agency. Shipton's proposals for a specialist standalone superannuation regulator and a standalone insurance regulator. Though I also support um, ASIC's plans for the restructure along the two um, principal divisions of, of regulation and supervision and enforcement. And I'll talk about that in a minute. I just wanted to highlight the reasons why I think um, ASIC's uh, remit should be decreased. In the first place, it's, um, its remit is too large. It's wider than that of any comparable global um, regulator. It's also chronically underfunded um, and, and historically has been. Successive uh, governments have been reluctant to properly fund the regulator. Though with the Royal Commission, there was a little bit of extra funding um, for pro, uh, supervisory, uh, new supervisory approaches such as the close and continuous monitoring program that involved um, the physical installation of ASIC staff in the banks to monitor their um, governance and compliance practices. But that came to an end or the physical presence of um, uh, regulatory staff in the banks was discontinued once um, COVID hit. So we've got um, chronic underfunding and also this seemingly ever expanding mandate, um, which instead of decreasing has been increased um, after uh, with the Royal Commission. For example, um, one of the recommendations was that uh, and uh, that ASIC have joint responsibility with APRA, our prudential regulator, for the um, bear. So the um, what is it? The um, banking executive um, accountability regime now called the FAR. Um, and with this expanding mandate, though, there hasn't been a corresponding increase in, in funding or capability, uh, especially the appro having appropriate skills, um, experience and expertise in regulatory staff. So I think for these reasons, um, we've, we're probably, I think we've expected too much of ASIC. So its lack of resources, for example, has forced it to fashion its enforcement to suit its limited resources. Um, and I think that ex partly at least explains the preference for negotiated settlements, including enforceable undertakings um, over litigation. And also ASIC has a um, record of pursuing small fry. So smaller companies and operators rather than larger companies and, high, and well, um, uh, you know, defendants with deep pockets because um, these easy targets are of course um, easier and cheaper to pursue. Other problems that have been identified um, in relation to ASIC are 
its regulatory objectives. Like there are actually six under the ASIC Act. It has six regulatory objectives where um, some of them are hard to reconcile. So there's the business facilitation of, uh, objectives. Um, and then we've got enforcing the law. Um, also, I think the government um, needs to prioritise issuing ASIC with a statement of expectations. Um, uh, the last one was issued um, um, to the Morrison government um, in 2021, and, of, and we haven't had any since. So I think it's hard, and, and uh, James Shifton made these points in a, a recent um, article that I found in the um, Australian Financial Review. Um, he's, he also said, like, it's hard for ASIC to develop a strategy uh, for its performance to be assessed. Um, and, and Shipton described it as, you know, running a regulator um, uh, without a, a statement of expectations is like um, having a pilot without a flight plan. This, though, does raise questions about ASIC independence. So while structurally it might be independent, um, it is subject to government um, guidance via these expectation statements. And the fact that it also relies on government appropriations um, means that it is really at the whim of the political tide so that it can't be truly independent. Its governance arrangements have also been found wanting. And, and there is, of course, the problem of regulatory capture. Now, as to the establishment of a new um, enforcement agency, even though that was Kerry's um, uh, part of the, uh, well, that's what she focused on, um, and she's very comprehensively set out the advantages and disadvantages, I do have some concerns about um, a new civil enforcement agency. And they are that a lack of funding for this body as well, um, as has been the case with ASIC, and we've heard about um, you know, with the most recent budget, budget cuts happening. So, um, you know, I really can't see this new body being funded appropriately. And also, and the reason that it needs to be is because civil penalty proceedings have not turned out to be the uh, cheap and quick um, enforcement mechanism it was envisaged that they would be. Uh, there have been problems with procedure um, and, um, even though um, it has, uh, Kerry was saying, it, it's a well-developed procedure has um, taken place. Um, I still think there are problems with procedure. Um, there's uncertainty about the, um, you know, what evidence is required to discharge the burden of proof. It, it's meant to be on the civil standard, on the balance of probabilities, but the courts have uh, consistently um, insisted on the Brigginshaw uh, standard, so the more onerous uh, uh, standard of reasonable satisfaction. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, so there's been pr problems, um, and there is and th there is no roadmap, um, and and that's something that's been called for. I've called for it, and others as well, like Brent Fissy, um, and so you know we probably need legislation as well because there have been calls for legislation or a uh, procedural roadmap that clarifies things like the the burden of proof the the actual procedure that needs to be followed and now this has been complicated by the fact that we that so many provisions are uh, dual track provisions another question I ask is um, how can we guarantee that this new civil enforcement agency is, is um, independent? And um, as Kerry pointed out, um, I've earlier argued for ASIC having a separate prosecutions division. Um, and one of the reasons for that is not just a lack of consistency in decision making, but that the delays um, involved. So um, I imagine that the same sorts of delays would, um, you know, bedevil this kind of um, situation as well, where ASIC um, hands over um, enforcement to this new agency. And, and of course, the unintended consequences for ASIC in terms of, of um, strategic regulation theory and the, the enforcement pyramid with civil penalties being a central feature of, of, that, of, of Australia's corporate enforcement regime. As just as quickly, current plans to restructure along the lines of um, 
you know, two divisions, um, regulation and supervision and enforcement. Uh, I actually, I think that's to be applauded. Um, uh, and it, it is in line with the, the, the general thrust of the uh, Royal Commission's recommendations. As far as enforcement is concerned, or well, what ASIC can do uh, will very much depend on it being properly funded. Um, and so funding is a problem. But as far as regulation and supervision um, is concerned, with the link between misconduct and defective uh, corporate cultures being spotlighted by the Royal Commission, super, uh, supervisory approaches, I think, are more important than ever. And while um, the, the um, physical presence of regulatory staff in the, in the banks um, has, has been discontinued, uh, there are other supervisory approaches that, that ASIC is undertaking. It did have a corporate governance task force that I now un understand has been sort of consolidated into a supervision group at ASIC. So, um, so they're my, that was my two cents worth, probably more than two cents worth, but thank you. I think we got the full dollar there, Vicky. Um, <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, thanks, Vicky, for your um, your insightful comments on uh, our presentation today from Kerry, and of course, thanks to you, Kerry, for your for opening up this issue. Uh, you know, I'm sure many on the call today have seen references to this from time to time in in the popular press, and it, it's just been fantastic to really delve into some of the complexities uh, of this particular proposal and and you know what potential benefits we might uh, get out of that. So certainly. Uh, many, many issues for us to think about. Um, now, I, I, if there are people who've got questions, uh, if you wouldn't mind typing them in the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar there, uh, just while we're, we're waiting for uh, questions, um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, so my first question is, uh, Kerry, you mentioned during the presentation that uh, as the, the uh, issue of does ASIC have a duty to conduct litigation fairly? And if so, what does that duty involve? I, I just wanted to ask, how does that compare with something like the Commonwealth's model litigant policy? I mean, is ASIC subject to that model litigant policy? And, and assuming that it is, um, how would that compare with a, a separate duty to act fairly? Where do those two things overlap? Yeah, I think that... Um... So in terms of the model litigant policy, the thing about that is that it's actually not enforceable by private litigants. Right. Um, so it is, um, in effect, an operational discipline on ASIC. Um, but the way that I understood um, Justice Gagler to be referring it is that it would be um, a much more of a fundamental duty to the court Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, that's it sounds to me anyway, kind of bringing up some of those discussions that we had around the James Hardy litigation, particularly in the New South Wales Court of Appeal. Now, I understand that was specifically in relation to the failure to call particular witnesses. And of course, that that so-called duty and its and its supposed effect were, were overturned by the High Court on the facts in that case. But that it's raising similar sorts of issues by the sounds of things. Yes, that's right. I think it's just in in relation to that context that the re, the regulator can, in the public interest, advance um, a, a particular regulatory agenda um, in in um, in bringing a case, um, and it's really the, trying to develop the content of well, to what degree um, mm. in terms of fairness. And I think the issues about dual track and individual rights um, actually flow into that, thinking about what sort of protections an individual um, and how mm -hmm. fairly ASIC should be actually, um, what sort of duty ASIC should be under in actually bringing a proceeding. It, I think that that's such a fascinating point about the, the attitude of the regulator as to how the law should operate and how that feeds into its litigation strategy. And I guess what's in the back of my mind when you say that is the concurrent operation of the ALRC's inquiry into Chapter 7. And, and certainly one of the key points that I've taken from that process over the last couple of years is just the 
extraordinary discretion that ASIC has in terms of formulating legislative instruments. So, you know, if I was in charge of ASIC and I had the agency had a particular view about how the law should operate, if, you know, do we spend potentially millions of dollars and get bogged down in a quagmire, potential quagmire of uh, commercial litigation against perhaps a very, you know, well-funded uh, defendant or group of defendants? Or if we've got a power to make a legislative instrument, do we just do that? And the, the fact that the ALRC has shown that, you know, in areas like Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act, the legislative instruments are two or three times the size of the actual legislation. Uh, and in many cases, you know, change what the legislation says. So uh, it, it's interesting how those two policies fit together. And, you know, thinking about some other Commonwealth regulatory agencies like the ACCC is an example, but also the ATO, and the fact that they have kind of test case uh, programs where they, they will actually go out and, and run test case litigation to try and get a judicial determination on an issue. You know, I, Kerry, you and I have been talking for a while about ASIC's annual reports over the years. And you know, one of the figures that comes from those annual reports is the this annual success rate in civil and criminal litigation. And the fact that in, in civil litigation, you know, in most years, it's it's more than 95% success rate compared to other federal regulators who are running test cases. You know, if, if you're winning virtually every case that you ever bring, just from my perspective, I think maybe you're not bringing the right cases. You're only bringing the kind of lay down Mazair cases, even though, as Vicky noted, ASIC has had some pretty high, fo high profile uh, failures. Um, we do have one question. I'm also just mindful of the time. So the, the question was from Lee and Lee asks, are there any examples of the model of a separate civil litigation agency operating effectively in other jurisdictions? Well, that is a great question, and I haven't managed to actually find one. Um, yeah, so the answer is no. Well, is <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, I, I'd love to be corrected, but my research has not turned up any. Yeah. Well, there's still plenty of time in the PhD, Kerry. So That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, if, the, if there's no further questions, uh, I'm just mindful of the time. We're about to tick over to 1pm. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for giving up their time. Thanks for the uh, people in the audience. Uh, I'm sure, uh, as I have, you've all got a lot to think about in terms of ASIC's potential role going forward and, and what some reforms might look like in this space if we think we actually do need uh, reforms. Thanks to Dr. Komono for her insightful comments. And thanks, of course, to Kerry for the presentation. Uh, so the next event in this series will be uh, next month on the 15th of June, when I'll be giving a presentation about the role of accessorial liability in corporate regulation. And our commentator for that event will be Vanessa Whitaker SC, who's at the bar here in New South Wales. So you can find details for that event uh, on the Let's Talk About Corporations website, which is hosted by uh, UQ. And thanks to the staff at UQ for organising this webinar today. And the recording for this session will be uh, distributed on the uh, web pages of UQ and uh, Sydney Law School. So thanks everyone for giving up your time today.